Close the Book by Susan Glassbell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Close the Book. Cast. John C. Read by Kimberly Welp. Peyton Root, an instructor in the university. Read by Chuck Williamson. Mrs. Root, Peyton's mother. Read by Michelle Eaton. Mrs. Peyton, his grandmother. Played by Garrett Goodison. Uncle George Peyton, President of the Board of Regents. Read by Todd. Bessie Root. Read by Sonia. State Senator Byrd. Read by Nima. Mrs. State Senator Byrd. Read by Eva Davis. Narration by Zames Curran. Place, a university town. Time, today. Scene, the library in the root home, the library of Midwestern people who are an important family in their community and who think of themselves as people of culture. It is a room which shows pride of family. On the rear wall are two large family portraits, one of a revolutionary soldier, the other a man of a later period. On the low bookcases, to both sides of the door rear, and on the mantel right are miniatures and other old pictures. There is old furniture, mahogany, recently done over, an easy chair near the fireplace, a divan left. A winged victory presides over one of the bookcases. A born Jones is hung. It is a warmly lighted, cheerful room. Books and flowers about. In addition to the rear door, opening on the hall, there is a door left and right a corner window. The curtain discloses John C. and Peyton on the divan. Mrs. Root about to leave through the door rear. John C. is piquant, dressed as a nonconformist, but attractively. Her dress should further the idea of her being a gypsy, but the whole should be charming and not bizarre. Peyton is a rather helpless young man, with a sense of humor that is itself rather helpless, dry, a little awkward, yet whimsical. Mrs. Root I'll see, Peyton, if your grandmother isn't ready to come down. Exit. John C. springing up. It's absurd that I should be here. Peyton. I know, John C., but just this once, as long as it means so much to Mother and doesn't really hurt us. But it does hurt me, Peyton. These walls stifle me. You come of people who have been walled in all their lives. It doesn't cage you. But me, I'm a gypsy. Sometimes I feel them right behind me. All those wanderers, people who were never caught, feel them behind me, pushing me away from all this. But not pushing you away from me, dear. You love me, Johnsy, in spite of my family. If I didn't love you, do you think I could endure to come to this dreadful place? Look about the well-furnished room. And meet these dreadful people? Forgive me for alluding to your home and family, Peyton, but I must not lose my honesty, you know? No, dear, I don't think you are losing it. And perhaps I'd better not lose mine, either. There's one thing I haven't mentioned yet. Hesitates. Mr. Peyton is coming to dinner tonight. Mr. Peyton? What, Peyton? Yes, uh, that one. And you ask me, standing for things I do in this university, to sit down to dinner with the president of the Board of Regents? Mother'd asked him before I knew it. John C., with scorn. Your uncle. He's not my uncle. He's mother's. And you see, it's partly on account of grandmother just getting back from California. He's grandmother's brother-in-law, you know. I suppose she doesn't realize what it means to have to sit down to dinner with him. She's done it so much. And then mother thought it would be nice for you to meet him. Nice. He's pleasant at dinner. Pleasant? Mother's a little worried about my position in the university. It would be wonderful for you to lose your position in the university. Yes, wonderful. And then you and I could walk forth free. Free? 
but broke. Peyton, you disappoint me. Just the fact that that man is coming to dinner changes you. Oh, no, but you are fortunately situated, John C., having no people. It's easier to be free when there's nobody who minds. I'm going. Oh, come now, dearest. You can't go when you're expected for dinner. Nobody's that free. Dinner? A dinner to celebrate our engagement. It's humiliating, Peyton. I should take you by the hand, and you and I should walk together down the open road. We will, John C., we will, in time. We should go now. Think so? Mother's going to have turkey. Better a dinner of berries and nuts. We'll have berries, cranberries, and nuts, too. Where are my wraps? Peyton, seizing her and kissing her. Some day serene and unhampered we'll take to the open road a road with berries and nuts grandmother peyton and mrs root have appeared at the door left mrs root mother this is peyton's friend miss mason one of our important students grandmother in her brittle way yes i never was a very important student myself i didn't like to study because my family were professors, I suppose. Peyton's grandmother is a descendant of Gustav Phelps, one of the famous teachers of pioneer days. John C., her head going up. I am a descendant of people who never taught anybody anything. John C. and I were just going to finish an article on free speech, which must get to the torch this evening. Grandmother, moving towards easy chair near the fire. Free speech. How amusing. You may be less amused some day, Grandmother. John C. and Peyton go out left. That may be a free speech. I wouldn't call it a pleasant one. Mrs. Root, sinking to the divan. Oh, he was speaking of the open road again. Berries and nuts. Grandmother, beginning to knit. Berries and nuts? Well, it sounds quite innocuous to me. Some of my young people are less simple in their taste. Mrs. Root, in great distress. Mother, how would you like to see your grandson become a gypsy? Peyton a gypsy? You mean in a carnival? No, not in a carnival, in life. But he isn't dark enough. And is that the only thing against it? I had thought you would be a help to me, Mother. Well, my dear Clara... I have no doubt I will help to you in time. This idea of Peyton becoming a gypsy is too startling for me to be a help instantly. In the first place, could he be? You can't be anything you take it into your head to be, even if it is undesirable. And then, why should he be? Doesn't he still teach English right here? In the university? I don't know how much longer he will teach it. He said the other day that American literature was a toddy with the stick left out, saying that of the very thing he's paid to teach. It got in the papers and was denounced in an editorial on Untrue Americans. Peyton, a descendant of John Peyton of Valley Forge. Motions to the Revolutionary Portrait. Denounced in an article on Untrue Americans and in one of those awful columns those silly columns they said maybe the stick hadn't been left out of his toddy but it isn't that peyton doesn't drink to speak of a look to the door left it's this girl she's the stick and i tell you people don't like it mother it's not what we pay our professors for peyton used to be perfectly satisfied with civilization but now he talks about society makes light remarks i should say that was going out of his way to be a disagreeable what business has a professor of english to say anything about society it's not his department i told peyton he should be more systematic how did this gypsy get here she was brought up by a family named mason but it seems she was a gypsy child who got lost or something 
and those masons took her in i'm sure it was very good of them and it's too bad they weren't able to make her more of a christian she is coming to have a following in the university there are people who seem to think that because you're outside society you have some superior information about it well don't you think you're needlessly disturbed in my day a young man would be likely enough to fall in love with a good-looking gypsy not very likely to marry her times have changed mother they marry them now both sigh oh, of course it's very commendable of them grandmother grimly oh quite commendable i was brought up in university circles i'm interested in ideas but sometimes i think there are too many ideas an embarrassment of riches so you have set out to civilize the young woman i'd rather have her sit at my table than have my son leave some morning in a covered wagon i wonder how it is about gypsies about the children i wonder if it's as it is with the negroes mother it would be startling wouldn't it if one of them should turn out to be a real gypsy and take to this open road mrs root covering her face oh quite likely they do it by motor mrs root rising mother can you say such dreadful things and just when i have this trying dinner oh i wish bessie would come goes to the window she is a comfort to me where is bessie she's away in the motor again covers her face bessie feels dreadfully about her brother she is trying to do something she said it would be a surprise a happy surprise someone heard in the hall perhaps this is bessie enter mr peyton oh it's uncle george uncle george early i know come to have a little visit with elizabeth goes to grandmother and shakes hands how are you young woman my nerves seem to be stronger than the nerves i see around me and how are you george oh i'm well but responsibilities the bank i'd rather run ten banks than a tenth of a university you can control money i'm sorry uncle george that peyton should be adding to your worries what's the matter with peyton wild oats well i wish you'd sow them in less intellectual fields i am prepared to speak freely with you uncle george the matter with peyton is this girl well they're going to be married yes entering his gesture of protest and i think it's a good thing she won't be in a position to say so much about freedom after she is married but they say she's a gypsy she won't be a gypsy after she's peyton's wife she'll be a married woman yes but in the meantime we will have swallowed a gypsy and now i was just wondering how it would be about the children mother please don't be indelicate again pause well if there's nothing else we may speak up let's talk about free speech they're writing a paper on it in there i don't know what this university is coming to an institution of learning it isn't that i don't believe in free speech every true american believes in free speech but slight pause grandmother with emphasis certainly ask them to come out here with their paper on free speech i'll be glad to give them the benefit of my experience yes it will be delightful to all be together exit door left this girl doesn't look to me like one who is thirsting for the benefit of another person's experience she's a bad influence she's leading our young people to criticize the society their fathers have builded up there's a great deal of ingratitude in the world enter mrs root followed by peyton and jauncey i told uncle george you were eager to bring him and jauncey together jauncey this is mr peyton who looks after the affairs of the university for you students of course you've heard about miss mason uncle george one of our cleverest students yes we were speaking of miss mason's cleverness just the other day in a board meeting 
And just the other day at the student assembly, we were speaking of how you look after the affairs of the university for us. I hope you both spoke affectionately. Well, Peyton, very busy, I take it. You're adding to your duties, aren't you? Not that I know of. Your grandmother said something about a highfalutin paper on free speech. I suppose that's an inherited tendency. You know, one of my ancestors signed a paper on free speech. It had a highfalutin name. The Declaration of Independence. I wish Bessie would come. Do you think much about your ancestors, Peyton? Not a great deal. Peyton has some rather interesting ancestors, Miss Mason. There's Captain John Peyton. That's his picture. He helped win one of the battles which made this country possible, the country in which you are living. And a descendant of John Peyton, Richard Peyton, indicates other picture, gave the money which founded this university, the university in which you are now acquiring your education. John C., lately. Perhaps it would be quite as well if this university and this country never had existed. I don't see why Bessie doesn't come. Of course, I look at it as an outsider. I am not a part of your society. Peyton is. There's Bessie. Bessie rushes in. Bessie. Grandmother. Swiftly kisses her. How wonderful to have you with us again. Dear Uncle George. Glad you got here, Bessie. Your mother has been looking for you. Bessie, with a look around. Isn't it beautiful to all be together? A real family party. And now, we have a moment or two before dinner, mother. The man who brought the turkey in from the country had a runaway, so it was a little late in arriving. How fortunate. Oh, it does seem that all things work together for the best. Mother, I have had a completely successful day. Where have you been, Bessie? I've been fifty miles to the north, in Baxter County. Does that mean anything to you, Jancy? Nothing whatever. Bessie still breathlessly dear uncle i hope you will understand what i am about to do it might seem unrestrained not in the best of taste but it's just because you stand for so much in peyton's life that i want you to hear our good news as soon as we hear it ourselves you knew that these two children were in love and going to be married a bow from uncle george you know chancy dear i may speak very freely may i not i believe in free speech yes how dear of you Jancy has endured in proud silence a great grief. And now, dear child, because of the touching dignity with which you have stood outside and alone, it is a moment of special joyfulness to me when I can say, Welcome within. What are you talking about, Bessie? You must not stand outside society. You belong within the gates. You are one of us. I'm not. Dear child, you are as respectable as we are. Jancy rising i am not of course you can't grasp it in an instant but i have looked it all up dear i have the proofs well it wasn't your affair bessie i made it my affair because i love my brother jancy dear as one who tells tremendous good news your father was henry harrison a milkman in the town of sunny centre an honourable and respected man your parents were married in the baptist church i deny it i deny this charge bessie stepping to the rear door dear senator and mrs bird will you come now enter state senator bird and mrs state senator bird mrs bird carrying a large book jancy dear you are about to enter upon the happiest moment of your life for state senator bird one of our law-making body is a cousin of your dear dead mother senator bird aggie's little girl approaches john c with outstretched hands she stands like a rock and here john c is your cousin mrs bird who has come all this way to assure you you have a family mrs bird indeed you have there's ella andrews one of our teachers a lovely girl she's your first cousin we are second cousins you may have some little family pride in knowing that i was last spring elected president of the federated clubs of baxter county just last week i entertained the officers of all the clubs at our home our new home erected last year after your cousin ephraim completed his first term in the upper house of the state legislature 
your cousin ephraim has been re-elected he is on the ways and means committee uncle george approaching senator bird i have heard of senator ephraim bird of the ways and means committee that was good work you fellows they talk aside and to think jancy that your cousin mrs bird is a prominent club woman grandmother after a look at jancy her cup runneth over isn't bessie wonderful mother how did you find it all out bessie from clue to clue i worked my way to sunny centre i would say to myself do this for peyton do this for jancy and so i heard of an old minister who had been there for years and years i went to him and he had married jancy's father and mother dearest child your mother taught in his sunday school oh yes aggie loved the baptist sunday school it's very strange that my mother i am referring to mrs mason never told me of this but she never told you you were a gypsy either did she no she just wanted you to think you were their own child and then i suppose you heard some foolish tale at school you see jancy's mother and father her real ones died of typhoid fever before she was two years old they got it from the cows well the harrisons were friends of the masons they all worked together in the church and so they took jancy and soon after that they moved away and we lost track of them you know what a busy world it is particularly for people who have duties in their community i haven't accepted this story you can't prove it mrs bird impressively hands her husband the book iowa descendants of new england families oh yes that is one of the books in which our family is written up to peyton my dearest boy from my heart i congratulate you pages fifty seven to sixty one inclusive our devoted jancy to our family my own family appears on page one thirteen senator bird holds the book out to jancy who once more stands like a rock uncle george steps forward oh you are a descendant of peter bird one of those daredevils whose leg was shot under him at bull run you heard that jancy a descendant of peter bird whose leg was shot under him so this is what i was brought here for is it to have my character torn down to ruin my reputation and threaten my integrity by seeking to muzzle me with a leg at bull run and set me down in the baptist sunday school in a milk wagon i see the purpose of it all i understand the hostile motive behind all this but i tell you it's a lie something here hand on heart tells me i am not respectable reaction i am john c john c a child of the gypsies i am a wanderer i am an outlaw yes you are jancy and did you ever stop to think how you came by that outlandish name it has always assured me of my birthright well you'd better look in your geography you were named after a town in india where your mother's missionary circle was helping to support a missionary aggie was crazy about the missionaries jauncey falling back breaking oh peyton i release you from our engagement no no don't say that stoutly i love you for yourself alone in spite of anything that may be true but i must say bessie jauncey beginning to sob oh i can't bear it i can't bear it and to think that peyton's mother was an illegitimate child mrs root dazed what's that grandmother rising yes what is that am i to understand am i to be told at my age that i gave birth to an illegitimate child this is a surprise to me and not a pleasant one peyton to john c it would have been better not to mention that this is reaction i think perhaps we need a physician i don't need a physician peyton certainly told me that his mother was an illegitimate child of course peyton if you were just boasting about your family say so what have you to say peyton before he says anything bessie 
You bring me that portfolio from the lower right hand corner of my desk. Key in the upper left hand pigeonhole. Peyton? Why, I didn't mean any harm, Mother. I certainly didn't mention anything against you or Grandmother. Quite the contrary. I was just anxious that Jancy should have a little respect for our family. It didn't seem to have a leg to stand on. So you made it up? Out of whole cloth? No, not out of whole cloth. Out of a cloth, then? Kindly tell me, out of what cloth? Peyton is not himself. Well, it just came into my head that it was possible. You see, Grandmother, you're having moved. I do wish you could see that I meant nothing against your character. Absolutely the contrary. But you're having moved. My having moved where? You're having moved from New York State to Ohio at just that time. I always did like to travel. Is that anything against a person's character? I was claiming that you had character. I'll stick to my own, thank you. I've had it quite a while, and I'm used to it. But I'd like to know right now what there is so immoral in moving from one state to another, even if you are going to have a baby. John C., raising her head. There is nothing immoral in anything. Fiddlesticks! Bessie returns with portfolio. You found it, Bessie? The key? Here. Peyton, come here. Opens portfolio. Takes out rolled paper. Happily preserved for the defense of my character in my old age is my wedding certificate. This is painful. She turns and looks at the prince on the rear wall. Motions Senator Bird to join her. I want you to look at that date right there. Beside that pink cupid chair. Perhaps it is, anyway. Read aloud the figures which you see. Peyton, sullenly. Uh, 1869. And here, in this other document, very fortunately on hand to meet the attacks of my only grandson upon my integrity, what do you read there? Clara, aged six weeks. And the date? Mrs. Root, Bessie, Uncle George, all listen a little anxiously. <sighs> December 1871. A sigh of relief. I trust now, Peyton, you will admit that a woman may move from one state to another without being dissolute. At this word, Mrs. Root is unable to bear more and hides her face in her handkerchief. Uncle George, as one saving the situation... Genealogy is interesting. One is democratic, of course. But when there is behind one what there is behind us, Senator, it enhances one's powers, responsibility, obligation. He has taken up the book and been running through the pages. Descendants of John Peyton. Here, Peyton, are some things about your ancestors. Read them. Perhaps then, instead of tearing down, you will have an impulse to build up. I commend this book to you young people for study. It will do you no harm to think a little of those worthy men from whom you have come. Mark's place with a card. John C. springing up. I shall waste no time thinking of the worthy men from whom I come. If I am related to a lawmaker, I owe it to my soul to become a lawbreaker. You see, Bessie, what you have done... When I thought there was in me no taint of civilization, I could put up with your silly conventions. But if in a material sense I am part of your society, then I have a spiritual obligation to fulfill in leaving it. Peyton, respectability threatens to wall us in and stifle us. Are you ready to walk from this house with me tonight, entering upon a free union that says that? Snaps her fingers. For law? Why, certainly. Well, if it comes to a matter of not caring to claim relationship, we certainly hesitated some time. Those Harrisons were not all they should be. John C., a note of hope in her voice. No? I said to Senator Byrd, now that the girl is marrying into one of the best families in the state, not that that influenced us especially, but I said, if she is trying to make something of herself, we must stand by her. And we will mention only pleasant things. We will not allude to what her grandfather did. 
what did he do? He burned down his neighbor's house, cause that neighbor chased home his pigs. Really? Yes, my grandfather would do that. Were any of the family found in the charred remains? The family, I believe, escaped. But no thanks to old man Harrison. No, I'm sure grandfather meant them to burn. Seizing book. I wonder if grandfather's protest is recorded in this book. That book does not emphasize unfortunate occurrences. And how right it is. One should think only of the good in human nature. Peyton, looking with Jauncey. What is this fine print at the bottom of the page? Mrs. Bird, hastily. That is not important. It is in fine print because it is not important. One of the descendants of Peter Bird. To Jauncey. The legged bull run, you know. He... Peyton, remember that you are in your own house. Unfaithful to the high office of treasurer of the Baxter County Cemetery Association. Jauncey, gasping, then beaming. <gasps> Why? Why? A grave robber? Was he a near relative? I must say, Miss Root, that we did not come here to have our family inquired into as far back as ancient history. Oh, Mrs. Bird, I quite agree with you that it is not necessary to go too far back in any family. Neither necessary nor desirable. Those early days must have been very trying. Chauncey, the fine print of your family is thrilling. Here is a man. Peyton, stop reading from that tiresome and obsolete book. It is not hospitable. Turn to your own family history and read a little fine print in it. The other members of the Peyton Root family give each other startled, nervous glances. Why, what a lovely idea. Uncle has marked it for us. After looking. Fine print in our family? Mrs. Bird, grimly. It's there. Genealogy is so confusing. I never could understand it. And I don't see why one should try to understand it. Live well in the present, that is sufficient. It looks to me as if that book has not been thoughtfully edited. I'm surprised at his soul. Peyton, snatching the book from Jauncey. Jauncey, don't want to boast. I hope I shall not become a snob. You too had a family, and they had their impulsive moments. But what was the most largely low-down thing a man of the early days could do? Right of stage, Peyton's and Roots draw together anxiously. Left. The birds wait complacently. As Uncle has pointed out, John C., I am a descendant of Captain John Peyton. But when you have a remote ancestor, you also have his less remote descendants, a fact sometimes overlooked. Well, Stuart Peyton... Mother, I wonder if the turkey isn't ready now. It's time for it to be ready. Exit. Stuart Peyton convicted of selling whiskey and firearms to the Indians. Assumes an overbearing attitude. I guess the early days were trying in more than one family. Peyton, peering into the book. And what is this? What is this? Stuart Peyton was the father of Richard Peyton. Who founded this university? Peyton, in the voice of Uncle George. The university in which you are now acquiring your education. Oh, I have no doubt that inducing the Indians to massacre the whites was profitable. A good sound basis for the family fortune. Young man, you go too far. Peyton, holding book out to Uncle George. In thinking of these worthy men from whom I come? Turns to wall on which hangs portraits of John and Richard Peyton. We don't seem to have Stuart's picture. <laughs> John C., I don't know that we need to leave society. There seems little uh, crevices in the walls of respectability. And whenever we feel a bit stifled, we can always find air through our family trees. I think, Senator, that we will not remain longer. Enter Mrs. Root. Mrs. Root. Mary was just coming. Now we'll have dinner. Yes, a little family party to celebrate the happy... Peyton. Again bent over his family history. 
Grandmother, here's something about your ancestor, Gustav Phelps. Grandmother, rising with weight. Peyton, close that book. Curtain. End of Close the Book. The Fourth Act by Basil MacDonald Hastings. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fourth Act Dramatis Personae Narrator Read by April Walters Sir Philip Alcorsi Read by Thomas Peter Mr. Robert Volpas His Secretary Read by Alan Mapstone Miss Daphne Aloa Read by Devora Allen The Voice from the Corner Read by Philip Gould The Fourth Act Scene Sir Philip's Study in Carlton House Terrace the room is handsomely furnished and carpeted. In the right wall, slightly upstage, is a large window. The door is in the back wall, slightly to left. The whole of the left wall and right half of the back wall and the lower part of the right wall are covered by books. Down right is a small set of steps, such as is used for getting books from high shelves. In the center is a large writing desk with revolving chair. There is another chair to the left of desk. Below the desk is a comfortable couch. Close to the left end of couch is a small smoker's table. It is a bright summer morning, and the sun streams in through window right. When the curtain rises, Sir Philip Accorsi is discovered looking out of the open window to the right. He is a good-looking, clean-shaven young man of about thirty-two, shouting through window, Keep your back straight and keep your right foot still, Alan. That's it. Plant it there and make a resolution not to move it. Keep your bat straight. There are boyish cries from outside. Bravo! Middle stump! Hooray! Hooray! Enter Mr. Robert Valpaz, Sir Philip's secretary. He is a gentleman of about the same age as Sir Philip. Familiarly. I say, Philip, there's a girl here, and I can't get rid of her. Oh, confound it. Just when I'm busy coaching the boys in cricket what shall i say coming from window that means you want me to see her eh robert i should if i were you she's got the smartest hat on i ever saw sternly private secretaries should have eyes for the head and not the hat what does she want won't say won't go dared me to carry her out I'd like to. Frowning. Robert, you're a perfect idiot with women. Well, I like that. No more than you are with cricket. Get rid of her. He returns to the window. Robert shrugs his shoulders and goes out. Philip now shouts further advice to the boys outside. Mr. Robert Valpaz returns. Shall I send for the police? Oh, confound it. Robert, you're worse than useless. Is she a lady? Certainly, I should say. Then she'll go if I tell her to. Show her in. Exit Robert, smiling. Talking through window. Pitch him a bit shorter, Phil. It's better to be a trifle short than too well up. Here, put a shilling down and try to hit it. He throws a shilling out of the window. Now don't fight for it. Split it afterwards. Put that off stump straight, Alan. During this, Robert shows in Miss Daphne Aloa. Daphne is a pretty woman of about thirty. Her clothes are tailor-made and practical, but still very smart. A rakish little fur hat gives a touch of individuality to her appearance. Robert carries her attaché case. Good morning. To Robert. Put my luggage down. Robert puts the case on the desk and gazes admiringly into Daphne's eyes. Mr. Valpas. Exit Robert. Don't scold him. He's been such good company. Oh, has he? Will you be good enough to say what you want? I don't... I can't see people without appointments. Every moment of my time is occupied with... Boys' voices. Aren't, Aren't you, you coming, coming to, to play, play Daddy? Daddy? 
Daphne peeps round his shoulder at the open window. <clears throat> Take a chair. Daphne sits in chair left of desk. Do you mind if I make a note? N no, but I shall be glad if... Have you a pencil? Certainly. There it is. He gives her one. This chair is uncomfortable. May I sit down there on the couch, just by that dear little table? She sits on sofa. If you like. Daphne moves to left end of couch. She produces notebook from attaché case and places it on the little smoker's table. Then she makes a note. Certainly. Make yourself at home. Philip, bending over attaché case and noting its contents. I knew it. I knew it. You're an actress. That case contains the typescript of a play. I know a mile off. You're an actress, aren't you? Indeed, no. I'm an author. Despairingly. An author? Worse and worse. Yes, Sir Philip Accorsi. An author. Now you know why I am here. Gloomily. I can guess. For many months I have been working at a play. I want you to produce it. Groaning. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. But you produce so many. Everybody knows you are behind the Archbishop's Theatre, and they say you have a share at Please, please, please. In the first place, what is your name? Daphne Aloa. Daphne Aloa. You've never written anything before in your life, have you? Daphne shakes her head. Of course not. Suddenly you read a fatuous paragraph in a paper that a play might be worth a hundred thousand pounds. So I did. Of course you did. You immediately get an idea. You tell a friend about it. A literary friend, perhaps. She is. She has had a poem accepted by royalty. I knew it. This friend encourages you, heaven forgive her. You write your play, and it's generally a frog of nonsense composed of what you remember of Charlie's aunt, the sign of the cross, the bell of New York, and the Drury Lane pantomime. You hawk it round the managers. I didn't hawk. I couldn't hawk. Well, you offer it anyway. No one will produce it. So you sob your heart out and try and get a job as a dramatic critic to get your own back. Meekly. And are all beginners the same? Well, you're something of an exception. You're the first author that ever got into this room without an introduction. Now, Miss Aloa, I can't produce your play. I can't. I won't. I can't. I... Oh... If only you knew how I'm pestered. But don't you like it? You're a multimillionaire, passionately devoted to the arts. Passionately devoted to fiddlesticks. I detest the theatre and all its works. You detest the theatre? Then how on earth does it happen? I support the theatre because I can't help myself. It's a family curse. A family curse? Yes. The first folio of Shakespeare was dedicated to one of my ancestors. Philip? left center by small table. Ever since then the family has been quite mad about the drama. I inherited millions, certainly, but a big share of it is tantamount to a trust fund which must be used for theatrical enterprises. Every decade, for instance, I'm practically committed to presenting Shakespeare in a new way. I'm an impresario against my will, I tell you. It must be very hard, certainly, to have to spend so much money on what you don't like. Now, if it were the musical profession, I'd enjoy it. I adore a good music hall show, don't you? No humbugging art about it. It's real. It's actual. It's satisfying. Lockhart's elephants and Carnot's mumming birds and all that. Precisely. Not forgetting boiled beef and carrots. But surely there are some plays that are real and actual and satisfying. I'm sure mine is. Dear me, yes. I was forgetting about your play. What's it about? Myself. Oh? That's... that's... well, that's different. Everyone can write one play or one book. Oh, I've heard that so often. It's truer than you think. Well, my play is in four acts. She takes out script. But there are only three there. Exactly. The fourth remains to be written. Indeed. I'm going to write it here. My dear lady, I really must ask you— First, with your permission, I want to make a sketch map of the room. What is called a scene plot, I believe. 
but i tell you that my time boyish voices are heard calling from off right dad 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 going to window i'll come out in a few minutes he closes window going to window and looking out are those your boys yes you're a widower aren't you yes curious you're a widower with two boys and i'm a widow with two girls look she produces a locket there are my two girls diffidently very charming their names are daphne and ursula the one on the right is ursula quite so and the one on the left is daphne quite so but we must get on with our work mustn't we our work oh yes i know you'll help let me see window up right she makes notes door in back hall slightly left large writing desk center with revolving chair below desk a comfortable couch room for sit beside me will you just room for two she rises and he after her smoker's table to left of sofa she returns to steps and sits on them it is a bright summer morning when the curtain rises sir philip accorsi is discovered he is a good-looking thank you clean-shaven philip feels his chin bright-eyed young man of thirty uh thirty-three thirty-two thank you thirty-two just a little opening talk with the secretary and then i come on where were you standing oh bother it does that matter a little stand at your desk will you she guides him to a position above the writing table then i come on impetuously like this suddenly i stop and i'm frozen to the spot what on a morning like this besides you weren't no but i ought to be it's the way things happen in plays i should be frozen to the spot and then i should melt into your arms madam yes but then i ought to have known you before watch how i would do it i would come in so i would freeze to the spot so and then i would exclaim with a genuine air of astonishment so it is you of course it's me i mean i ah but you ought to be something out of my past you should be the man who robbed me of my fortune or something like that you should have promised to marry me and deserted me for an heiress i suppose you never did jilt me did you certainly not daphne makes a note no i'm afraid i've never seen you before in my life you have not daphne makes a note and i'm busy wistfully ah don't say that again i'm not really joking or rather i'm joking to make the interview pleasant for you if i were tragic you wouldn't like me and yet it is true that i and my little girls are very nearly at the end of our bread money ah don't curl your nice mouth i like you severe better than sympathetic and you know you agreed to help me with the play if you are telling me the truth about your financial position don't bother any more about the play let me give you an introduction to still taking notes you ought to move about more on the stage the characters have to keep making crosses they don't sit still all through an interview do you mind walking away somewhere and coming back stamping petulantly up the window this is really very ridiculous thank you so much petulantly stamping up right she makes a note what are you writing down there everything you say or do are you a newspaper woman or a private detective or a busily writing splendid splendid that was almost dramatic why are you writing this down because this is the fourth act everything we say makes up the dialogue miss aloa i ask you again to go he picks up her hat and hurts finger on pin damn quite right you must you must ask me again and again or the fourth act won't be long enough ah uh, don't get really angry don't you see that like the nice kind man you are you are giving me everything i want thank goodness for that my play is about a girl who wrote a play about me the first three acts tell the story of how i came to write that play and what happened when i took it to the managers every word of it is true then what's the trouble because the managers won't produce it how can they without a happy ending can't you make a happy ending no but you can i see if i say that i will finance the play you write that down and bring down the curtain on it how quick you are 
and the corollary is that I throw away some thousands of pounds. And the C-O-R-R... -R Writing. Please spell corollary. Forgetting himself. C-O-R... Oh, hang it. Spell it yourself. That's right. Be brusque and rough. Bully me. And then melt. Come up to me and smack the open palm of your left hand with your clenched right and say... There's a crash from off right. Whatever was that? One of my boys fall into a cucumber frame. He goes to window, and Daphne, after putting down her notebook on top of steps, follows him, looking out at the boys. Aren't they just lovely? Pleased. Like their father, don't you think? How old are they? Well, Philip's eight, yes, eight and two months. Alan's a few days short of seven. Eight and seven? Why, I should have said at least twelve and ten. Pleased. Would you? Rather. How lucky you are to have boys. My little girls are dears, but it's not quite the same thing, is it? Well, there's a difference. Softly. When... when did their mother die, Sir Philip? When Alan was born. Ah. Uh... She stands, watching at the window. Philip comes down to desk. Stand back to them, dear. She pulls open window. You'll get hit on the knuckles every time if you play forward to that sort of ball. Stand back and lift your bat high. Ah, that's better. Right ha, ha There's a burst of boyish laughter. Philip gazes at her in amazement. What do you know about cricket? As much as most men. She shuts window. I'd love to go down and play with them. May I? You want to go down there? But what about the fourth act? Yes, but I was beginning to despair of your helping me. Look here, I'll... I'll do what I can. Genuinely surprised and grateful. You... will? How splendid of you. Not at all. You're as irresistible as my secretary said you were. He's a bit of an ass, but he was right this time. Sit down. Shall I? Where? Here, on the sofa. She sits, and he sits beside her. Where there is just room for two. Tell me about the play. Is there any love interest in it? Yes, but not for the principal character. And the principal character is you? Mm-hmm. Designing widow, aren't you? Well, yes, but in the nicest possible sense. Oh, yes, of course. Do you think that the play has a dog's chance without some love interest for the heroine? It would be better, I admit. But you see, every line of the play is true, and I can't invent a lover for myself. Supposing I were to invent one for you. Yes, I admit I'm getting interested. You seem a clinking good sort. Can you bowl? Yes, quite a decent leg break. Almost fervently. A decent leg break? Yes, I'm sure of it. Well, it would be quite easy to make love to you for the purposes of your play. I'd hate you to put yourself out. Not at all. I'm really disengaged till twelve. You'll want the notebook. Yes. She rises. But still, if you don't feel like it, it won't be much use to me. I can be desperately in earnest for the time being. You aren't the only pretty widow in the world. Picking notebook from desk. No, I dare say you're in practice. Begin. Sit here. He indicates couch. Meekly. I will. Rising and clearing his throat. <clears throat> now I will begin. Do you... Do you... Don't look at me. No. You should realize what is coming and look away. Make patterns on the carpet with your toe. Slightly raising her skirt and scraping the floor with the tip of a pretty shoe. Like that? Yes. He comes closer. Just like that. You're writing something on the carpet. What is it? Yours truly, Daphne Aloa. You're the most adorable woman I've seen in my life. Writing in her book. You're the most adorable woman I've seen in my life. Do you really think so, Philip? Yes, dear. Making note. Yes, dear. That's good. Dear. Don't you think? I feel so at home with your eyes. Some widow's eyes make you feel as if you're out for the night. Some, Some widow's, widow's eyes, eyes make, make you feel, feel as, as if you're, you're out, out for the night. night. Writing. 
It's a risky line. Do you think I ought to put it in? Oh, yes. The censor will cut it out. And then you wear your clothes so cosily. You make a sort of chrysalis of them. Making a note. You dear. No necessity to write your dialogue. I shall remember every word of it. You're so cousinly and all that. Whatever that may be. Making a note. You're the sort of girl who comes on Sunday afternoon and stays forever. Hmm. A sort of spare room girl. A sort of mistletoe girl. A sort of taxicab girl. A sort of sit out the next foxtrot girl. Next foxtrot girl. Philip, you've got me set. Now you ought to propose. Already? Unless you think it would come as a shock to me. Very well. One minute. What is it? I must turn away and make patterns with my toe. She lifts her skirt and writes on the carpet again. What do you write this time? Yours truly, Daphne Accorsi. Mr. Lower. Daphne. Daphne writes. I'm sick of not being engaged, aren't you? Oh, dear, this is realism. What would you have me say? Well, I thought you'd begin like this. Intoxicated by your maddening beauty and thrilled by the evidences of your sublime intellect. I hate intellect. I offer you my heart, my name, and my fortune. As for your play, I will arrange for its simultaneous production in five capitals, and... And will you stop to lunch? That's your idea of a happy ending? Yes. And after all, I'm the author. Well, put it that way if you like. What is your answer? My answer is yes. Now you kiss me. He hesitates a little. Only a stage kiss. What sort's that? You all but do it, but you don't. Philip puts knee on sofa and leans over her. How's this? He bends over and kisses her. Thank you. She writes. He kisses her. And now again. He kisses her. Thank you. She writes. He kisses her again. It doesn't seem right somehow. Doesn't it? it? Seemed all right to me. No. Stage directions always say, he snatches her to him. Can you snatch? No, but I can try. Well, I'll show you how it's done, and then you can snatch me. She throws her arms around him and kisses him. Like that? I don't think much of that. You bumped my nose. I can snatch better than that. How's this? He makes a grab at her and presses her to him. You are very quick to learn. Oh, it's just a knack, just a knack. I hope that's all it is. Swinging himself about. I like this act. I knew you would. Let's go on with it. But a kiss is an ending. Nonsense. It's a beginning. I think you might say something more. I'll whisper it. He whispers in her ear. <laughs> I must write that down. What? It can come after the curtain's fallen, if you like. But when the curtain falls, that is the end of the play. Yes, indeed. And now that the act is finished... She draws a line in her notebook. We must not pretend any more. Oh, Lord, yes. I was pretending, wasn't I? Well, I'm quite willing to be serious after the curtain has fallen. To be serious? I mean, to be sincere. He places his hand on Daphne's. Philip. She catches her breath as his meaning dawns upon her. Let's pretend the curtain's down now. Better than that. We'll have it down. He comes to prompt corner. Do you mind letting down the curtain, please? Certainly, sir. Philip takes Daphne's left hand in his right, and they wait while the curtain falls. When the curtain rises, they are seen in close embrace. When they realize the curtain is up, they break the embrace and pretend to be concerned about other things. End of the Fourth Act by Basil MacDonald Hastings Household Gods, a comedy by Alistair Crowley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Characters Crassus, a barbarian from Britain. Read by Thomas Peter. Adela, his wife a noble roman lady 
read by Michelle Eaton. Alicia, a servant in the house. Read by Sonia. A statue of Pan. Read by Zames Curran. A fawn. Read by Eva Davis. Narration. Read by Chuck Williamson. The scene is at the hearth of Crassus, where is a little bronze altar dedicated to the Lares and Penates. A pale flame rises from the burning sandalwood, on which Crassus throws benzoin and musk. He is standing in deep dejection. Smoke without fire. No thrill of tongues licks up the offerings in the cup. Dead foes desire. Black smoke thou art, O altar flame, that dost dismember, devour the hearth, to leave no ember to warm this heart. I see her still, Adela dancing here, till dim gods did appear to work our will. The delicate girl, diaphanous gossamer, subtly revealing her brave breast of pearl. Ah, she's withdrawn at dusk to the wild woods, mystic beatitudes that dur till dawn. Let life exclaim against these things of spirit, mankind that disinherit of love's pure flame. He bends before the altar and begins to weep. Ye household gods, by these male tears I swear that ye shall grant this prayer. All things at arms shall be put straight, harmonized, reconciled by some appointed child of some far fate. A curtain has been drawn aside during this invocation, and Alicia advances. She smiles subtly upon him, and giving a strange gesture, makes one or two noiseless steps of dancing. Master still said, These faint and fearful shores of time are beaten by the surge of sense, love worn away, by love to indifference. Who knows what god or demon she adores, or in what wood she shelters, or what grove sees a profane our sacrament of love? I saw her follow the stream in the hollow where never apollo abides so thick are the trees that never the breeze stirs them or sees what satyr inhabits the glen what nymph in the pool of it hides lighter of foot than a sylph or a fairy sinuous weary i passed from the airy lawns where the flute of the winds made tremulous music for man i followed the ripple of the stream i crept where the waters wept the floss in the foss gurgling across the bosses of moss like a dryad's nipple in the mouth of pan o oh, pearl of the house you came to the end the dusk of the slave the dawn of a friend freedom is thine for the skill and the will the skill is mine but the will lies still still as the earth that dare not stir till the kiss of the sun awaken her yet at these secrets and riddles behold i can fill thy lap with a harvest of gold yet all the gold you could give to me would fall at my feet when i rose to be free what will you then no gift from man of my own free will I give you wit, O oh, man, so sorely in need of it, and happiness, and the flame that hath dwindled on this dull hearth shall be rekindled. But this you must swear, to will and to dare to seek the spirit and slay the sense, and for this hour to give me power to lead you in silent obedience though I bade you fall on your sword. Enough! I give my life as I gave my love. <laughs> oh, love, you have not understood. You have not guessed its secret food. You have not seen its single eye, 
but fear and doubt and jealousy have risen and now your love is trembling like a mountebank dissembling when his tricks detected come to find home we must leave home starless and moonless hidden in cloud the night's one flame of pearl the bat flaps the owl hoots aloud lead on i trust you girl <laughs> you are bold to trust me or have you divined my secret no the crystal of your mind shows only faint disturbing images things passing strange as if enchanted seas kept their great swell upon it and strange fish played in its oily depths some monstrous wish the shadow of some unspeakable desire strikes my heart cold and sets my brain on fire learn this as we pass through the portico fear nothing there is nothing you can know and by these terraces and steps that gleam wintry although the summer night is hot this what we seek is never what we find life is a dream like love and from the dream if we may wake we never find it what we would for the wisdom of a mightier mind leads us in its own ways to a perfected praise why are these shadows thrown across the lawn from the elms and yews they were not one to reach beyond the branches of that copper beech attend the dawn of an unknown comet that shall come from the unfathomable wells of space into its halidom i know it not last night i walked alone here and saw nothing <laughs> i was not with you there is no god upon the eternal throne of stars begemming the bewildering blue unless one has the eyes to see him think how we too stand upon the brink of nothing he is a globe whereto we trust no larger than the smallest speck of dust or mote in the sunbeam is to that sun's self and we are like dead leaves in autumn's will of wind upon it mystify me girl it is the right of an elf surely your flickering fire will draw me to some mire here the stream dips its mouth into the wood so does youth's calm and chaste beatitude touch the black mouth of love the ancient whore girl what a scorpion leaping from your lips my mouth stings as no scorpion ever stang in this round impudent smiling face of mine there is a poison fiercer than all wine and from these eyes more subtle sorrows pour than you can dream these teeth have been at grips with gods i have sung what no girl ever sang these ears have heard an insufferable word what do you mean the secrets in a kiss here are no kisses here great artemis rules only in the woodland may a man hide his eyes from her pledge himself to pan come through the tangled arches of cypresses and larches stoop under artemis we walked upright but this is pan's home and the house of night they enter the wood so when i stoop my cheek comes close to yours give me a kiss the poisonous apple lures thus the boy's mouth beware oh you are fair fairer than ever in this tangle of trees your hot breath wraps you in perfume there is some gloom or doom a bitter harsh ingredient in these my sorceries of animal scent yes there is fear mixed with the fascination it is the reverence that chastity be sure gains from the impure o oh, virtuous nation 
it is the fear of the uninitiate before the throne of fate the hierophant kiss me however <laughs> did i grant this favour all were lost it is your truth to adela that tempts my youth <laughs> henceforth alicia shakes with silent laughter what little breasts you have i maiden breasts would you betray my oath my will contests my wishes wait and you shall surely see part of the secret that ensorcels me see all these bosses it is not as if a titan smote himself into the earth and was caught into her made one with her the scent is fierce and hot like a rotting panther's slot you two are matched with mirth shaking each other like two wrestlers what should stir your melancholy but laughter look before us the light streams a tremulous chorus oh, it is vague and vacillating love young love of maidens is the soul thereof and in the midst behold o oh man the image of great pan i fear him <laughs> go and lie there at his feet lie supine lie on that moss-covered root while i draw forth the flute and make a marvellous music <laughs> she ceases laughing and begins to play Oh, I rise beneath the force of lips, a finger's life that touch the delicate stop so delicately. Hush! I have drawn the bird from the bush. Pan will appear anon. Ah! 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 Oh, this music moves you. Now I'll play a tune that would make mad the melancholy moon this ah oh, you tear my soul out with the trills your fingers play like summer lightning on the shaft it is like a storm on the mountains when it trills like the angry sea when it booms <gasps> hark <sighs> some god laughed your mouth is like some god's it burns and blooms with fire unheard of with unguessed perfumes oh let me kiss you so you stop my song she ceases the tune there is another song oh, you do me wrong for you love adela by god girl no i love alicia <laughs> you love her so <laughs> your laugh is shocking why do you mock me dear <laughs> because you will not guess my secret here but put your arms about my neck and swear you love me and will always keep them there then i might dare i swear it oh my sweet then take my kiss your mouth is like a rose of fire but what is this i cannot bear it i ooh, ooh, it is my heart this arrow strikes me through stir not one muscle for a moment death you beast you kill me with your urgent breath oh how i love you he moves violently fool now all my pain must be gone through again it is sure your chastity is unstained by crime you do the wrong thing just at the right time why do you charge me all the wood is springs and love is hovering over us with his wings <laughs> sub penis penis hush you break the spell 
oh you great fools of men i know you well but nothing is so detrimental to love as to be sentimental i will yet make you wise know that i have the magic to disguise myself in many ways do you feel this lie still tis heaven were ruined by a kiss i am a butterfly such idle flitting as to a flower like you is fitting now i'm a mole do you think you know me now here is the earthworm severed by the plough you are a witch i want your love you give only love's comedy <laughs> the way to live is to find comedy and tragedy in everything but if you cannot see through to the bacchanal spirit this should suit here is the blacksmith hammering a flute oh love love kiss me i will forge a ring of bloom of blood kisses upon your neck till it is like a garden of roses in late spring soft and stung softly fairer for a fleck o oh, marvellous nation vanity dullness slobber and quotation <laughs> why do you love me if you scorn me so why did i say i loved you i say no why do you make love to beguile the hour to crown my rose wreath with a greener flower to do my master's bidding that's to give life to yourself who only think you live but listen have you seen the nine waves roll monotonous upon the shoal rising and falling like a maiden asleep then with a lift and a leap the ninth wave curls and breaks upon the beach and rushes up it swallowing the sand i am that ocean now you understand alicia oh this is unbearable surely this wave washes the shore of hell each follows each remorseless and indifferent as nature is to each creature wonderful wonderful woman <laughs> she throws her head back and laughs now you think you know my secret i have given you drink and you are wise but hush to all emotion save this the pulse and swell of ocean for at the last with mouth and fingers right all must proclaim the triumph of the tide ah still you mock me with your cruel laugh it is your foolish epitaph but this can be no mockery even sway and curl and thrust these waves are not at play you feel the ocean breaking on the shoal but passionless and moveless is its soul ah but your soul is in your breath only as the graven image of death which men call life and ignorantly adore spare me i cannot bear you more then i will drown you lock your fingers fast in mind and let our mouth mix at the last the statue of pan is seen to be alive shrill shrill over the hill the hunter is hot this is the kill scream scream dissolving the dream of the life the knife to the heart of the wife the fountain jets its flood of blood and the moss that it wets is an amethyst flame of violets who shall escape murder and rape what i am alive in my solemn shape shrill shrill over the hill the hunter is hot this is the kill the heart of the home is a fury of foam the storm is awake and the billows comb but though i be the frenzy of glee i am also the passionless soul of the sea mine eyes glint fire 
and my cruel lips curl mine the desire of the god and the girl but fierier and fleeter and subtler and sweeter than the race of the rhythm and the march of the meter is the shrilling shrilling of the knife in the killing that ends when it must o oh, the throb and the thrust in the death in the dust the silence the stillness of satiate lust the solemn pause when the veil withdraws and the man looks on his god and the causeless cause still still under the hill the hunter is dead this is the kill pan spoke pan never speaks till man is dumb and only then if he be like a child silently curled within its mother's womb or feeding at her breast there is a wild way also when his dumbness is of death and there's a first and second death remember to die so that no god's or angel's breath may quicken into life the wasted ember i am dead now but i must raise you up the night grows darker all pan's light is gone and you and i are pledged to sup upon a secret all your secrets shown <laughs> oh when you know it <laughs> but you must divine adela's shrine i am weary of adela grown chaste and chill the hunter legs how heavy is the hill but you are bound to adela to you but you have given me freedom i will leave you what have i done to grieve you you have been the solemn fool with face awry that i have gathered in my ecstasy you are only a vulgar primrose that i have plucked at least she devil you have been well treated oh tragic farce not even rhymes completed nay darling no rebellion when you know my secret you will understand you are bound to adela within the portico to me upon this ground by day in life adore the lares man by night in death make offering to pan can you cut day from night by any endeavour if so both life and death were lost for ever come the stream steepens this road leads to hell the way to heaven is shorter who can tell <laughs> i have measured it you girl it is not hard what did you make the height of it one yard you always mock me pity of my youth i swerve not from you stumble at the truth i like not jests this is a serious journey why did you make a mocker of your attorney the way to rome leads through the apennines bacchus has horns beneath the crown of vines if you fear horns make some polite excuse not to invoke him by the name zagreus a fawn passing among the trees ye thought me a lamb with a crown of thorns i am royal a ram with death in my horns so mild and soft and feminine ye held me aloft and frowned on sin but i was awake in your clasp as i lay i roused the snake from its nest of clay and ere ye knew i had sunk my forehead through and through harsh and horrid through all the pleasure of rose and vine i thrust my treasure the cone of the pine eru's maid was easily sated for she was afraid when eru mated <laughs> would not laugh were you the maid how could i be great calf but you are all the same 
blaspheme and jeer at any mystery beyond your sphere of beer and beef and beer and beef and beer <laughs> now you have frightened the shy god why heed between your arms is all the god i need prudish and coarse to the last now hush indeed the stream kisses the lake we near the shrine stir no snap twig let your foot even yours fall like a fawn's your breath is like new wine hush now no porpoise gambles how obscure is the glimmer of the lake is that the isle yes in that shadow lurks a smile see from that jagged cloud diana starts like a deer from the brake her silver splendor darts through the crisp air to the grove upon the isle do you see her do you see her monstrous vile these eyes betray me no your adela lies with arms thrown back head tilted open sighs her lips flame out like poppies in the dusk the breeze brings back to us a scent of musk her mouth is oozing kisses filthy harlot i never fed on a superb scarlet and look the wonder of plumes that foams upon her tidal breast oh but a swan a swan a swan snow white with his soul scarlet hidden in the abode forbidden oh but his eye swoons as his broad beak slips within her luscious lips oh but i cannot see i long to die alike for wonder and for jealousy vile filthy whore i'll catch you at it soft see how his feathers hold her soul aloft beast have you brought me through the wood for this <laughs> now wonder i must teach you how to kiss i'll clip his wings so penis penis <laughs> slife it's not the wings of him that clip your wife thou art as filthy a creature as she fat fool all your emotions vary with your what your state of health be off with you foul well i'll swim and stab them the black mouth of hell yawns for their murder i'll be at the death dive then but softly scarcely draw your breath oh she's unwary is your love forgotten our love is rotten but your pure love for me you boasted of ay that was perfect love you love me then not her indeed i do swear me the oath anew i swear to love you till the world shall end then crassus i will always be your friend ah oh, that is good you do not mock me now creep softly to the land kiss but my brow my curls are wet no never touch me there why have i not oh you have not just my hand you disobey your mistress's command the time is near when you shall see the keyhole of my comedy <laughs> hush you coarse slave we'll surprise your good wife in her mystic exercise quick through the bramble they burst through upon adela now you beast i've got you the curse of god and plague of naples rot you for this white brute one slit 
he cuts the throat of the swan with his dagger o oh, love betrayed o oh, my dead beauty foe deceitful maid not crassus found me out had i the wings of my dead love o oh, love why wondrous things these nails shall serve a servant she shall be my wife damned witch when i have done with thee the swan dies i'll kill her now but see my swan is dead yes and what light is breaking overhead what blaze of blue and gold envelops us oh marvel oh miraculous what is it why my lover's life in me once concentrated now diffused illumes the endless reaches of eternity with infinite brilliance with intense perfumes oh then your lover was some god's disguise and you have robbed me now beware your eyes she springs at alicia who guards herself easily but in the struggle her robe tears take care a boy a boy then what am i <laughs> that is the key word of the comedy you thought you had two vices at your need but she had jove and you had ganymede <laughs> they are struck dumb and still with amazement alicia claps her hands four times sweep through the air bright blaze of eagle wings crassus sup penis penis how he swings his bulk from yonder sightless poise to bear me back to the dominion of the air where i shall bear the cup of jupiter blind babes love one another no less true because the gods have deigned to dwell with you the eagle bears ganymede aloft adela this mystery is too great for you and me to estimate but widowed both come seek domestic charms as we were wont in one another's arms what perfect moss for you to lie upon i am your wife dear crassus soto voice Oh, my swan. Curtain. End of Household Gods by Alistair Crowley. Mosada by William Butler Yeats. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mosada. And my Lord Cardinal have had strange days in his youth. Extract from a memoir of the fifteenth century. Dramatis Personae. Mosada, read by Sonia. Ebermar, read by Thomas Peter. Kaula, a lame boy, read by Charlotte Ducketts. First Monk, read by K. Hand. Second Monk, read by Chuck Williamson. First Inquisitor, read by Anusha Ayer. Second Inquisitor, read by Michelle Eaton. Narrated by Abai. Scene one. A little Moorish room in the village of Azubia. In the centre of the room, a chafing dish. Mosada, alone. Three times the roses have grown less and less, as slowly autumn climbed the golden throne, where sat old summer fading into song, and thrice the peaches flushed upon the walls, and thrice the corn around the sickles flamed, since among my people, tented on the hills, he stood a messenger. In April's prime, swallows were flashing their white breasts above, or perching on the tents, a weary still, from waste seas crossed yet ever garrulous 
along the velvet vale i saw him come in autumn when far down the mountain slopes the heavy clusters of the graves were full i saw him sigh and turn and pass away for i and all my people were accursed of his sad god and down among the grass hiding my face i cried long bitterly twas evening and the cricket nation sang around my head and danced among the grass and all was dimness till a dying leaf slid circling down and softly touched my lips with dew as though twas sealing them for death yet somewhere in the footsore world we meet we too before we die for azolar the star-taught moor said thus it was decreed by those wan stars that sit in company above the alpujarras on their thrones that when the stars of our nativity draw star to star as on that eve he passed down the long valleys from my people's tents we meet we too she opens the casement the mingled sound of the voices and laughter of the apple gatherers floats in how merry all these are among the fruit but yon lame cola crouches away from all the others now the sun a shining on the little crucifix of silver hanging round lame cola's neck sinks down at last with yonder minaret of the alhambra black athwart his disc and cola seeing knows the sign and comes thus do i burn these precious herbs whose smoke pours up and floats in fragrance over my head in coil on coil of azure enter cola all is ready masada it is so much the worse i will not share your sin it is no sin that you shall see on yonder glowing cloud pictured where wander the beloved feet whose footfall i have longed for three sad summers why these new fears the servant of the lord the dark still man has come and says tis sin they say the wish itself is half the sin then has this one been sinned full many times yet this no sin my father taught it me he was a man most learned and most mild who dreaming to a wondrous age lived on tending the roses round his lattice door for years his days had dawned and faded thus among the plants the flowery silence fell deep in his soul like rain upon a soil worn by the solstice fierce and made it pure would he teach any sin gaze into the cloud yourself none but the innocent can see they say i am all ugliness lame-footed i am one shoulder turned awry why then should i be good but you are beautiful i cannot see the beetles and the bats and spiders are my friends i'm theirs and they are not good but you are like a butterfly i cannot see i cannot see but you shall see a thing to talk on when you're old under a lemon tree beside your door and all the elders sitting in the sun will wondering listen and this tale shall ease for long the burden of their talking griefs on my knees i pray you let it sleep the vision you're pale and weeping child be not afraid you'll see no fearful thing thus thus i beckon from her viewless fields thus beckon to our aid a phantom fair and calm robed all in raiment moony white she was a great enchantress once of yore whose dwelling was a tree-wrapped island lulled far out upon the water-world and ringed with wonderful white sand where never yet were furled the wings of ships there in a dell a lily blanched place she sat and sang and in her singing wove around her head white lilies and her song flew forth afar along the sea and many a man grew hushed in his own house or among the merchants grey hearing the far-off singing guile and groaned and manned an argosy and sailing died in the far isle she sang herself asleep at last but now i wave her to my side stay stay or i will hold your white arms down ah me i cannot reach them here and there darting you wave them darting in the vapour heard you your loot upon the wall has sounded i feel a finger drawn across my cheek 
the phantoms come <laughs> they come they come i wave them hither my breast heaves with joy ah now i'm eastern hearted once again and while they gather round my beckoning arms i'll sing the songs the dusky lovers sing wandering in sultry palaces of ind a lotus in their hands the door is flung open enter the officers of the inquisition young moorish girl taken in magic in the church's name i here arrest thee it is allah's will touch not this boy for he is innocent forgive for i have told them everything they said i'd burn in hell unless i told them all and let them find you in the vapour she turns away he clings to her dress it was alas will now cords no need to bind my hands where are you sirs for ye are hid with vapours round the stake the vapour is much thicker god the stake ye told me ye would frighten her from her sin no more take me instead of her great sirs she is my only friend i'm lame you know one shoulder twisted and the children cry names after me lady i come Kola, following forgive forgive or i will die mosada stooping and kissing him twas alas will scene two a room the building of the inquisition of granada lit by stained window picturing saint james of spain monks and inquisitors will you not hear my last new song hush hush so she must burn you say she must in truth will he not spare her life how would one matter when there are many Ebramar will stamp this heathen horde away you need not hope and know you not she kissed that pious child with poisonous lips and he is pining since you're full of wordiness come hear my song in truth an evil race why strive for her a little moorish girl small worth my song i had a sister like her once my friend touching the first monk on the shoulder where is our brother peter when you're nigh he is not far i'd have him speak for her i saw his jovial mood bring once a smile to sainted ebramar's sad eyes i think he loves our brother peter in his heart if peter would but ask her life who knows he digs his cabbages he brings to mind that song i've made is of a russian tale of holy peter of the burning gate a saint of russia in a vision saw sings a stranger knew a risen weight by the door of peter's gate and he shouted open wide thy sacred door but peter cried no thy home is deepest hell deeper than the deepest well then the stranger softly crew cock-a-doodle doodle do answered peter enter in friend but twere a deadly sin evermore to speak a word of any unblessed earthly bird be still i hear the step of ebrema yonder he comes bright-eyed and hollow-cheeked from fasting see the red light slanting down from the great painted window wraps his brow as with an aureole ebrema enters they all bow to him my suit to you i will not hear the moorish girl must die i will burn heresy from this mad earth and mercy is the manna of the world the wages of sin is death no use my lord if it must be i pray descend yourself into the dungeon neath our feet and importune with weighty words this more that she forsway her heresies and save her soul from seas of endless flame in hell i speak alone with servants of the cross and dying men and yet but no farewell no use 
away they go hear o oh, thou enduring god who giveth to the golden crested wren her hanging mansion give to me i pray the burthen of thy truth reach down thy hands and fill me with thy rage that i may bruise the heathen yea and shake the sullen kings upon their thrones the lives of men shall flow as quiet as the little rivulets beneath the sheltering shadow of thy church and thou shalt bend enduring god the knees of the great warriors whose names have sung the world to its fierce infancy again scene three the dungeon of the inquisition the morning of the auto da fe dawns dimly through a barred window a few faint stars are shining swallows are circling in the dimness without o oh, swallows 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 will ye fly this eve to-morrow or to-morrow night above the farmhouse by the little lake that's rustling in the reeds with patient pushes soft as a long dead footstep whispering through the brain my brothers will be passing down quite soon the cornfield where the poppies grow to their farm work how silent all will be but no in this warm weather among the hills will be the faint far thunder sound as though the world were dreaming in its summer sleep that will be later day is scarcely dawning and hassan will be with them he was so small a weak thin child when last i saw him there he will be taller now twas long ago the men are busy in the glimmering square i hear the murmur as they raise the beams to build the circling seats where high in air soon will the churchmen nod above the crowd i am not of that pale company whose feet ere long shall falter through the noisy square and not come thence for here in this small ring hearken ye swallows i have hoarded up a poison drop the toy of fancy once a fashion with us moorish maids begot of dreaming and of watching by the door the shadows pass but now i love my ring for it alone of all the world will do my bidding sucks poison from the ring now tis done and i am glad and free twill thieve away with sleepy mood my thoughts and yonder brightening patch of sky with three bars crossed and these four walls my world and yon few stars grown dim like eyes of lovers the noisy world divides how soon a deed so small makes one grow weak and tottering where shall i lay me down that question is a weighty question for it is the last not here for there a spider weaves her web nay here i'll lay me down where i can watch the burghers of the night fade one by one yonder a leaf of apple blossom circles in the gloom floating from yon barred window newcomer thou art welcome lie there close against my fingers i wonder which is whitest they or thou tis thou for they've grown blue around the nails my blossom i am dying 